So we were in front of the Rhode Island Computer Museum in Warwick, Rhode Island. We used to come out to Warwick, Rhode Island to go to the big computer shows that used to be over at Rhode Island College over here. Yeah, when I found out that there was this Warwick Computer Museum, I was like, oh, we gotta go because the ultimate junk's cart, which cannot happen, <laughs> would be to go back to those computer conventions. Yes. I believe those to be foundational to our relationship. The routine was go to that, buy $250 worth of normally monitors for every, so every <laughs> always needed a monitor. And then we would hit the, a Boston market that is now a Chick-fil-A yeah. And what would we eat? Macaroni, macaroni and cheese. And cheese. Uh, you know, look, right next door is yeah, a computer just museum. Just down the road. We already have seen the warehouse of incredible things. Now we get to see what does it look like when it's curated. Yeah, let's see it. is these cars have two speeds on and off. Right as we walk in, I see like a history of computers and a little video game station here. Are they mostly mini consoles? They all see? work, yeah. yes. Oh look, and there's the, the bad, game. bad games. Yeah. This really does have just about everything you'd want in a Genesis. It's like all the really best games of a Genesis. It comes with two wireless controllers. That's a great deal. Yeah, there you go. And then get to the S's. If you do it, like anywhere above pointing it directly at the system, it stops. <laughs> It stops responding. Go to Sonic 2. We all know what that sounds like. Such a piece of garbage. This is an MSX machine that's been built into an Apple II case. So MSX had a lot of games never really made it to the US. Is there like a game you like on MSX? Not really. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I haven't really explored the catalog. Famously Metal Gear, I think was on. Yeah, right? started on there. There's a nice informational sign about how the internet came about through the Cold War. Oh, it's an acorn. That's an acorn. It's a little old. It needs it needs some servicing. So if you hold the shift, it looks like some of the keys on the keyboard are not. No, they are. It's just I gotta get it into the right mode. There it goes. Uh, oh, please stop tape. Please stop tape. <laughs> please stop the tape. It's a little arcade game. So how does one play? How many players? Just, just one. Just you. <laughs> Got ready, player one. Okay, oh, the uh, space bar jumps. Arrows up in the corner there. <laughs> oh, I pressed the break button, then everything went kapooey. The Boston Computer Society, a defunct computing organization in Boston, and I won their programming contest in 1992 and went up to Boston, Massachusetts with my mother. No way! I received an award for a program I had written for an Apple II. What did it do? Little programs to make computing easier. There was one that let you draw little pictures, file organization. They stopped existing around 98 or so. Early Intel development machines. And then this is the main room in there. Now this is a computer. That is great, actually. That's the classic background. Oh, that's some Oregon Trail or Oregon Trail. You may be a banker from Boston. Yeah. I was always a banker from Boston. You got more money? <laughs> EJ, Nana, Franca. Glow. Oh, glow dies and doesn't turn. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be bereft. I once worked for an executive. She had a G3, a white border G3. Computers had moved on from the G3. Yes. I, I think we were at like G5. And she was like, it looks really good in my office and I don't want to upgrade it. <laughs> I was like, do you use it? It's She's just like, not about, really, no. It's I just, just like, about the aesthetics. And this is my favorite Commodore, the 128D. I do have one of these at home. Most of the best games have been made in the past five to 10 years. Really? Now that people have had tons of years with the machines, they can figure out all kinds of, you know, special tweaks to make incredible things. You know, there's a Rocky Horror Picture Show game for the Commodore. Is there? Yeah. Oh. These are all TI-99 games. And I had that model right there. I didn't have a cassette drive for it, and I didn't have a disk drive, and I didn't have any games. So the only thing I could do is type in programs and hope it didn't get turned off. I love the manual. The story so far. You're a Marine, one of Earth's toughest, hardened in combat and trained for action. Three years ago, you assaulted a superior officer <laughs> for ordering his soldiers to fire upon civilians. He and his body cast were shipped to Pearl Harbor while you were transferred to Mars, home of the Union Aerospace Corporation. <laughs> yeah, they, all games would have, like, huge stories, because you couldn't tell in the in the game. Yeah, so you had to just be like, look, you're part of something huge. <laughs> oh, I love it. I haven't played it on a PC in a long time. I've played it on crappy consoles. That's all i played it on. Nina's been playing Oregon Trail over there for a while. Am I dead yet from dysentery? <laughs> this is a really cool thing, and you won't be able to represent it with video, but you put the glasses on, and it's eye tracking. So you could like pick things up and move them in multiple dimensions. Oh yeah, these are the tracking glasses. Okay, cool. 
And so once you're actually sitting at it. So that's your mouse. Whoa. Now pull it toward you. Yeah, pull it out of the screen. And, and rotate it. <laughs> so you can take that and drop it in the crystal. And there's a camera here that you can, it's really cool. That grab, is really you can cool. Grab the camera and look inside. That'll show up on the top right screen. And you can grab the camera. Yeah, Mike, too. Mike Thompson. I'm on the board of directors and I fix the ancient machines. You know, real typewriters are complete mysteries to the younger people. They <laughs> just don't understand. No like, idea. How do you change the fonts? Yeah. <laughs> this is an Atari, a late Atari computer. The only computer at the time that had built in MIDI ports. Lots had option cards where you could get it. But that made it really popular with musicians. And they've got a nice little setup here so that you can can try out MIDI on the actual Atari. They use the rock band keyboard here to get it done. This is later Atari though. So Jack Trammell, who ran Commodore and had great success with the Commodore machines, left after a conflict. And he went over and picked up the rest of Atari's computing business and released this line of computers, the uh, STs. I'm making great progress. The Mac SE. Isn't it funny how the OS hasn't changed all that much? Well, you know, they really nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I think we I think we got it. It's files, it's folders. Oh, did you see the Lisa, John? So John? a lot of them that are in the Lisa case are actually been converted to Mac XLs. <laughs> So real Lisa's are unusual. We were over at the Quonset warehouse and we saw one. Lisa is kind of interesting because when I was 12, my computer teacher in the middle school, Westport Middle School, bought me a book about the Lisa. And ever since then, I've always kind of wanted one, but they're so expensive mm. that even like over all the years, I've never wanted to spend, you know, $1,500, $2,000 for a system. There's one over there that the uh, batteries leaked. It's got four giant NICADs. Everything inside of the case, including the plastic, has got green stuff all over it. And that was the fate of a lot of these. Those yeah. NICADs leaked yeah. down and they ruined the backboard and then yeah. the plane too. Well, that one, the whole inside of the case is even coated with green. Just recently, somebody has started to make replacement boards, replacement okay. backplanes, so that you could transfer all the components over and use them. I've never been able to actually use a Lisa before. Like, sure. I know it's based on the Mac OS. Some behavior that's almost like what you would expect, but not quite. It's not exactly fast either. <laughs> Come on, let's go. It has a very <laughs> slow hard drive. You ever get really young people in here? What do they think of all oh, this? Yeah. They love it. Do they? Yeah. They play on all the games. Jeez. They don't care about that stuff. They don't care about the old stuff. They care about all these games. Yeah, well, uh, fair enough. <laughs> I mean, look at Nina. She's addicted. <laughs> The Apple II predates me by quite a few years, but, but it was still it still there. was the lab. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't until I was in eighth grade that they got rid of all the Apple IIs, which would have been 1990, like two and three. They had made such a huge investment in those apples. They didn't want to do anything like throw them away. You There's know? a game called Turtle that we used to play. Oh, Logo. You'd program the turtle to do things. Yeah. That was my first introduction to programming in the Westport Elementary School. Mm -hmm. It was developed specifically to teach children about programming concepts. Mm. I have cholera. No. <laughs> no. Frankie, you found <laughs> Mario 3. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, yep. A Hyperkin, yeah. So I see they have a, a, yeah. a Pi 5, first of all. That's what they should do, is they should have the RGB Pi on oh, an yeah. actual CRT, and then oh, yeah. they don't have to swap games. Yeah. Or we were just talking about how some of the early ICs that are in some of these machines have moisture intrusion into them, and that's causing failures now. None of this stuff was designed to last forever, and it's amazing that it's still worked as long as it has. And you can get a new old stock part that's bad. Nina got pretty far and then it said switch discs and she doesn't know what to do. There's a disc, disc emulator on the side of it. That's from a hobbyist. He runs the company called Big Mess of Wires and it is the very best Apple disc emulator for Apples and Macintoshes that exists. It has all the features. It can emulate hard drives. It can emulate floppy disks for Mac and for Apple. I might have cholera, but I'm alive. <laughs> You're still alive. Ray spins it and I push buttons. And then you can generate a little bit of energy. It gives you an idea of the mechanical resistance on when you're cranking it right. to the amount of light you're actually making out of it. I remember one day I had to go to work with my dad oh, yeah. and he was fixing a boat. That was what he did. He was a hydraulic mechanic. And the captain had a PC up in the captain's area and it played Duke Nukem. And I was like, wait, I can just go in there and play Duke Nukem all day, which was completely against the point. And it was great. Who is shooting at me? And how do I look up and down? Oh, now EJ has a broken arm. EJ has a broken arm. Oh, With God. a broken arm. I'm not gonna be able to film. I see you have 170 pounds of food on that on that wagon. What us young boys would always do is overhunt. And the wagon would just be carrying 
tons of bludgeoned carcasses. I haven't yet sought to hunt. I just keep buying little amounts of food along the way. Nice. We were trying to turn it into an action game at all times. Yeah, so oh just murder through. animals until we were satisfied. <laughs> just, oh, now you're down to 100 pounds of food. Inadequate yeah. grass. Inadequate grass. Inadequate grass. So we're almost at the fort. Very, Very little we're almost at the fort. This is one of my favorite machines, the Amiga 2000. I wonder if I can turn them on. How do you start? How do you power it on? I have no idea. <laughs> Got it on? Yes. And this particular one happens to be a former video editing machine. This is the video toaster cars right here that I think they're getting ready to set up. You had four channels of video that you could switch between. It's basically a real-time video switcher. To have that in a computer that was this size in that era was unbelievable. That changed the way that video production was done. This is normal NTSC video like you could put on a television and that is really what made these computers oh, so adaptable into the video industry. This had stereo sound that it could play back in real time in the 80s, in the mid 80s. You can get this machine to not only run Amiga software, but because it's got a 68K processor, they made Macintosh emulation boards where you can run a Macintosh on it. And they also made PC emulation boards. So you could run a Mac, a PC, and an Amiga on a single platform. That's something I would really like to set up and get running. I think it would be just super cool to be able to just freely switch between those three environments. So this came from an old mill. This is what they used to control the looms. So this is all data storage on cards. And then we went to punch cards, which has holes in them. Hey, these were only 80 characters on a card. On the smaller systems, the IBM 34s and stuff, they used 96 collop cards. In other words, used to... Um, Store data or run a program, you could run from cards. So like the, the, the hex of a file would be... Correct. Yeah, right. We have a small manual key punch machine here. So we went from cards to all different types of storage mediums. Paper tape, you all heard of things called core memory. This is a magnified example of core memory. And this is the memory itself. This is the size of the memory that went to the moon. That's how dense it was and this was woven by hand so then that was too big so we got smaller and denser a lot denser this is obviously manufactured by a machine and then we went to smaller so this is core memory same as this and now it's starting to look more like a ram card correct yeah that wasn't dense enough so we started to do chips on silicone but it's a slice like a slice of bologna so this would be about six or eight feet tall and they would just slice it they would dope components in here photographically so they would expose this to light which would have the chemicals on it, and then they would etch it. They would go back and forth, back and forth, building up the different layers. So they went under a microscope and they looked at it. Each one of these black squares are things that they rejected. So that's where you get the term chip. It's a chip of silicone. Today's stuff, this is a big piece of silicone. But if you look at the chips on here, they're a lot denser. This is a microprocessor on a chip. So this has got memory, it's got uh, logic units and all kinds of things. Yeah, that's a really helpful um, timeline. First and foremost, we have to store data. A series of ones and zeros uh -huh. that are that they have unique hexes that would define what the data is. Yes. And then we need more data. And we need more data. More data. More data. More data. Well, then we talk about like auxiliary storage. This is a three and a half inch floppy, which is inside. That's why they call it a floppy, because it's like this. Five and a quarter inch floppies. This is bigger than this, but this held more than this. Right, so we right. got smaller, but we stored more. Then we went to hard disks. So these were made up of many platters. These were the heads that they used inside the mechanism. So these heads would expand and float on a cushion of air on these disks. The cushion of air is like fifth of the size of a human hair. So it flew very close to the disk. And these heads, you can feel them, so very light, very. because they have to move very, very fast. Right. So when the disc pack gets scored, the heads would actually crash and slam down onto the disc. That's kind of an important distinction too, is that like for a long time, computers are manufactured to have a lot of mechanical components. Yes. Now they really have very few mechanical components. Well, they still operate the same way. The technology that we went from a disc pack with heads that stayed in the drive they went to disc packs with heads in the drive. And this is kind of like a proto spinning disc drive. Yes, this would spin and there's the head mechanism is right there. And then we went to drives like this. Yes. And then we went to drives like this, which are in a laptop, but you still see the same type of technology. Devices like this, this is a module, and it is three tubes in there. So there's two components inside the tube. So there's basically two circuits in that tube. So a computer would have thousands of these modules. Look, these things get warm. Right. So we went from this type of computing module so that's... to transistors. A transistor can either amplify or it can act as a switch on and off. Now inside these chips are what was in that piece of silicone I showed you. Those little tiny chips, those mm -hmm. are logic circuits. So you would need a lot of these cards 
to make up a computer. And as I showed you before on the other piece of silicone, you now have a computer on a chip. Take up less space, store more storage. Exactly. Take up less space, yeah. store more storage. And these are the early days of tape, believe it or not. Storing stuff on magnetic tape, as you saw also in the warehouse. Heavy. That's heavy, it's metal. Yeah. So the tape itself is not tape, it's metal. All this miniaturization enable us to get to things like this. So how many functions did this calculator do? Four. Multiply, divide, add, subtract. That's what this thing did. This is the first calculator made by Wang. It's an electronic calculator. He's over there by one now. This is from the early 1960s? 65. 65. It does your basic math operations. The Nixie tube display, if you want to do like 256 times 128, you put it in. You got it right there, but because it does its mathematics and logarithms, it's off by just a little bit. So you got to know how to round it in your head to basically to get your result. Over here, it's got a um, punch card reader inside. It'll actually read a key sequence off of this punch card and can run it. And very cool to see working. These Nixie tube displays and, and all these, these very old memory boards like actually operating. Is Nixie tube right now? So when back in the day when you connected to America online, you would dial a computer, you would hear a tone, right. and you would rest it in here. This is called an acoustic coupler, so it's linked by sound. The way it used to work, you know, AOL used to dial, the computer would do the dialing yes. and everything, but before that, you would pick up the phone dial yourself, and then you'd have to wait for, to hear the tone, then put it on so that the, the rest of the process And now start. the modem is connected to... Yeah, to now the like... modem is listening in and talking. This device here would transfer digital energy to audio sounds. No, I've never seen that Yeah, before. it's the predecessor to what we had is just the dial-up modems. How's Oregon Trail going? I forgot how important rest was. EJ, Nina, and Frank were all dead. Just Glow and John? It's just Glow and John. And John has typhoid? John has typhoid. Glow got lost for a day, but now she's back. Oh, good. Continue on the trail? All right, Nina's back there, still playing Oregon Trail. Everybody's dead except for Jun and Glow. Uh, and he has typhoid. I have so. typhoid. Did you enjoy your time? Oh, yeah. yeah. I love coming to this place. It's very cool. I think that calculator is pretty incredible. I love the Atari. I love so many different things. I'm really glad you were able to get us into the warehouse, too. Yeah. Because that like, provides a tremendous amount of context yeah. for what can come in and out of here. Yeah, I really want to thank Ray. Ray has been. Absolutely. He set up an awesome thing for us to be able to do this. No, no problem. It's a pleasure. Yeah. All right. Anytime. Pewter Smith. <laughs> <laughs>